being a female architect, there are some contractors who don't want to work with me. They're just like, really? oh, like lady architect, what? And I've had this on job sites where someone will recommend a contractor and I'll meet with the homeowner and I'll go through the project and you can just tell they just don't want to deal with me. And they're just like looking at the male client and my female clients there and we're just like, we're here, like yeah. we're here. And this guy is just completely dismissive. Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. I'm Trent Bell and today we are speaking with Maine licensed, licensed and NCARB certified architect Tracy Reed. Thanks for coming out today. Tracy's experience and interests are diverse with a background in master planning, architecture, public relations, political organizing and fundraising. It's kind of like all in one package you could, you could yeah. deal with there. Um, <laughs> For today's podcast, we are going to change it up a bit. I'm going to relax and play peanut gallery while Danielle Devine takes the reins for this conversation with Tracy. Danielle is the editor of Maine Home and Design and has been writing for, editing, and managing art, design, and architecture magazines for the past 13 years. So, don't miss Tracy's AIA Design Theory article in the upcoming August issue of Maine Home Design. Thank you both for coming to the studio today, and Danielle, take it away. Thank you, Trent. Um, so I want to start off with a fun question um, that relates to architecture, but also just you in general, if you have a certain style. Um, I guess my ensemble today <laughs> is uh, an example of my style is um, pretty... Richard Meyer? <laughs> <laughs> pretty simple. Um, like all of my clothes are American made, um, Taylor Swift. Um, oh my God, J brand and um, got my Vermont socks on and my colorful sneakers. I joke that um, my style is simple because I've got better things to do than brush my hair, put on makeup or tie my shoes. Uh, Trent and I both have blue shoelaces. Oh, look at that. Did that you be. intentionally oh, go I and didn't... get blue shoelaces after you bought your shoes? Um, all my shoelaces are blue. Oh. So oh. I, and they're all elastic. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> son got those. He loves them. Who wants, again, yeah. life is too short to Just spend slip time. Them on and go. Yeah. There's a bit of an Einstein shoes. thing going on here with me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my story with my blue shoelaces, though, is that these are the only brand of shoes I can wear because my right foot, I have plantar fasciitis. And if I wear any other shoes, I'm like, crippled in the morning oh. and I'm a very vain man and to be stuck with one shoe brand I'm like right, kills you me. Mix it up. so I was like oh I gotta I gotta do something here yeah. so I'm gonna get my blue laces and blue's my favorite color uh so a lot of my sort of accessories like coats if you call coats okay. accessories are blue. your jacket was blue when you showed up yes correct why blue it's a great and, and you can tell I'm, the peanut gallery just having okay. less peanuts, but yeah. um, I feel Democrats, like, my favorite color. <laughs> Wear it proudly. Right. I feel like it also goes easily with other things, like just kind oh, of yeah. like your style. Right. It's, you know, simple, mm -hmm. and you can mix it in right. easily. It's practical. It works. <laughs> I like that. Mm -hmm. My wife uh, really likes blue and cooler colors in the house for some reason. Okay. Um, we have a pretty stark house now, kind of a museum motif of concrete floor, white walls, large glass space. Not surprised. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, she's very insistent on like, now when we replace the couch, she wants a gray couch and then uh -huh. like blue accents and stuff, right. which, which I'm on board with. I think it'll be pretty cool. So. My accents in terms of my decor are all over the place and there's a lot of color, but I palette's a little bit more muted on me. <laughs> That's interesting. I feel like it's nice. I mean, I feel like it's nice to have like a wardrobe that's simple. I feel like a lot of creatives do have like white shirts. A uniform. Yeah, a yeah. uniform. Mm -hmm. I'm all about the uniform. I'm, how do you shop? I'm, I'm a little interested oh, here. Do you set out so and set hard. a day aside or do you guys like if you see a piece, something you like, you're like, all right, I'm just going to get it now and save some time. No. Because I've gone to like, I hate, because like an hour in, I'm just like, mm. I can't take this anymore. I got to get out of here. Right. So I've told myself if I find a piece of clothing that I'm like, whoa, I like that. I just buy it right then and there if it fits. Okay. And then I don't. for you. Yeah. So, which, you know, 
There are very so <laughs> if you have um, like a sort of philosophy of buying American made clothes that you know were made at a sweatshop. I probably should. It really limits where mm. you shop, right? So True. I can't really go to a mall. Uh, there are a couple stores in downtown Portland that oh. um, carry clothes like that, but uh, for the most part, you know, it's heavily researched and it's kind oh, of like specifying okay, okay. something in a building. Right. Hours and hours. That's commendable, Which, I have to say. Because <laughs> I, I usually go with just cheap and I know that's probably a pretty, cause I'm just like growing up how I did. I'm just constantly thinking yeah. like about like money's, uh, you know, nipping at the back. Like uh -huh. failure and bankruptcy is just kind of like. Over. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't have very many clothes, but the clothes I do have are versatile, practical, and Quality. yeah. I'd like to think my buildings are the same way. <laughs> so yeah, that leads me into, um, well, I feel like I was gonna wait for this question, but um, can we discuss sustainability? Sure, yeah, so I would say um, there are some architects in Maine and nationally that you know are doing passive houses, mm -hmm. net uh, zero living building challenge projects. My clients don't have budgets to support projects like that. Um, and that's typically not a goal that my clients are coming to me with. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, these are great projects. My projects um, are more practical. Like uh, one of my projects, uh, a lot of my projects are with small business owners. One of my projects uh, in Portland is like Rose Foods, working with Chad Conley. He also was Palace Diner down in Biddeford. Oh. And you know, when you're a small business owner, um, well, you're probably not making your bagel shop like a net zero bagel shop. Yeah. Uh, so money is tight, but everything has to function. Everything has to do double duty. Everything mm -hmm. is going to get beat up. And yeah, every dollar matters. So how we can stretch that um, and make a great product is essentially where a lot of my projects yep. are um, falling. So they're not, in a way, to me, that's, a form of sustainability mm -hmm. because if you're designing something that is going to get ripped out in five years or you're buying yeah. a piece of clothing that you're going to use or wear a couple times that's not a sustainable use of resources so what are some of the ways in your practice with tighter budget projects yeah. that you you implement sustainability oh it can be hard um, there's low hanging fruit, obviously, in things Sorry, like. I gotta just put that one yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, low hanging fruit in terms of like water conservation. Uh, I remember specifically with Rose Foods, um, Chad, you're a great client. Um, in terms of dishwashing, was a huge thing that um, mm -hmm. trying to find, you think about the. Um, how much they're like spraying down pans. Um, if you've ever baked something and just the goop that's like on it, um, trying to get a, trying to explain to clients that might not have thought about it, most people think of like high water flow as being more efficient because you can spray it off faster. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, yeah, but you put the kink in the hose and like the water is shooting out differently. Right, so. Yeah. There are a better nozzles. Better right. nozzles, right? So you know you can like cut your water use in half if you get the right equipment. I actually worked as a hydro porcelain technician for a couple oh, summers. Okay. So oh. dishwasher. Oh, I was gonna say toilet <laughs> cleaner. <laughs> oh, that's a good one too. Yeah. No, I was whatever job I had that I did not enjoy, I would come up with a very Fluffy name pretentious for it. sounding yeah. name for it. <laughs> the right. Porcelain technique. Yeah, so that is a huge, you know, if you think about um, and your processes for that, um, how can you, you how can you arrange workstations so that it's so efficient you don't have someone just running the water or yeah. um yeah, so a lot of water, a lot of lighting and just say HP naturally heating like with windows, thinking about the to a certain extent. Um, often my sites, my sites are mostly in town okay. and we don't have a lot of choice. We have mm -hmm. a street and um, our primary facade has to face the street. And it is usually 
we are maximizing the lot. And so we are building to the setbacks. And it's not like building in a greenfield site in the country yeah. where you get the great right. south orientation. Mm-hmm. And so it's a little harder to... I feel like when I go into Rose Foods, it is, like, very bright, which oh, is yeah. nice. Yeah. It is great. Like, it's very clean, nice aesthetic, um, which when we were talking about processes um, and how you kind of explained the process just now and how Trent explained his process, um, I kind of want to, do you think it's important to explain the process to the client for them to mm-hmm. understand? And do you think the way you explain it is different from a male architect? Oh, yeah, we talked about this. We drove down, we carpooled. So <laughs> I also, from a sustainability standpoint, like I don't have, I try to practice what I preach. So I don't own a car. I ride my bike or walk everywhere. Or sometimes a carpool. Uh, and my clients know, sometimes we carpool together. Um, That's great. Or, yeah, I run a zip car. Uh, because, and sometimes it can be hard. I have job sites that are way outside of Portland. I had a job site in Lisbon Falls. Um, so I'd always, you know, but... If I can't do the work and, in some cases, make myself uncomfortable trying to figure out how to make it work, Mm -hmm. how can I expect my clients to? Um, So I try to practice what what I preach and, like, try to live my life as an example of these are things that are achievable and we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, There are some things we can't. Like, we can't put solar panels on every building. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, like, we can. That is great. Um, so yes, in terms of process, um, it is, we do, I do a lot of commercial projects and so there are a lot of, a plethora of regulations and it's like, oh my God, building codes, zoning, ADA, fair housing, um, EPA, DEP, so many different regulations, Mm -hmm. which, um, are constraints. And I feel like as an architect, for whatever reason, there's a lot of educating that goes on to some of my, a lot of my clients are not institutional clients and institutional clients who are building all the time are more familiar with some of these regulations, but for small business owners may not have realized that if you are building a bathroom that you don't get to just lay it out how you would like to. There are, the plumbing fixture counts are by uniform plumbing code and uh, there are 80 regulations about even where you put your toilet paper. Uh, and that is usually surprising to people. The amount of, um, for lack of a word, constraints. Um, so in terms of process, as most architects do, you start meeting with a client and like hearing about their mm-hmm. hopes and dreams and budget. Uh, and then you go back and you do a fairly comprehensive code and regulatory review to like see how these come together. And it's almost like creating a Venn diagram, I Mm, guess, is you're trying to figure out like where those, the budget, um, the timeline, because sometimes there are things that I like and there was a window recently uh, that had a 10 month lead time in order to get the window, one window. Oh. Uh, it was also a $6,000 window. Um, but we couldn't wait that long. So, you know, there's all these different constraints. We have to meet all of them. And once you start putting the Venn diagram together, I feel like the project comes together very easily almost. Yeah. Um, we're in Biddeford today. <laughs> and just down the street, which is great, um, I worked on a project a couple years ago while I was at PDT Architects. Um, at Thornton Academy and when we first met with the administrators and the teachers they were telling us about you know what they needed and one of the one of the um, the librarians was talking about an unused or underutilized former gymnasium that they had study hall in and also used as a dance studio and we're like take us to this space because we needed to add classrooms um, and she had mentioned that at one point in the school's history it had been used as a library. And we were looking to potentially add classrooms in their mm-hmm. current library. So we're like, what do we do? Mm-hmm. And we walked over and we're like, oh my gosh, this should totally be a library. Because the windows in this space were eight feet off the ground. 
right? To keep the basketballs from. Right, right. And so we lined the exteriors under the windows with books. And then we're able to have study, you know, they were creating different captured spaces. I also talked about architects use all these ridiculous terms that no one who's not an <laughs> architect knows. Captured spaces is one of those. Like we're creating spaces within spaces by furnishing and then we were right. lighting it. So it felt like it was an intimate space, even though it was really a former gymnasium. One uh, of my favorite is value engineering. Oh, value engineering. I had a big value engineering meeting this morning. <laughs> So value, if you're not familiar with the term, <laughs> Cost it, it sounds like you're doing this great thing, right. like, oh, we're engineering value, oh, and God. all it means is, well, that got cut. Right, we're cutting something from the budget right. <laughs> in a thoughtful way, Yeah. in a thoughtful way. But right, value engineering, I mean, it should be on your LinkedIn profile as a, as a skill, because <laughs> if anyone's ever had a project and not had to, quote, unquote, value engineer, I want that client. Right. Everyone value engineers. Yeah. I mean, as an editor, I like to, when I'm using words, explain the words. <laughs> Typically, I mean, I have written for art publications mm -hmm. where, it, it, like you said, it's like very pretentious writing, uh -huh. using big words. Right. But um, in general, especially writing for design and architecture yeah. magazine, if the general public can't understand it, I like to right. define it. So totally. I think it's helpful when explaining a process to yeah. use terms that we're familiar right. with. And I, uh, I see that a lot in architecture magazines or in art-related mm -hmm. publications when people, even the Pritzker Prize, when, which is architecture's highest honor, uh, when you hear people talk about their work as architects, it is so hard to relate to in some ways, the yeah. way they talk about, you know, right all of these like very fancy academic sounding terms. Mm -hmm. But if you're not an architect, like you're like, what? <laughs> um, like one silly word that like we all know is like fenestration. Fenestration means opening in a building, i.e. windows or doors. But you'll talk about like the rhythm of the fenestration pattern and how it mimics adjacent buildings. And I was at a planning board meeting a couple weeks ago with um, an engineer um, and a young female engineer. She's an engineer intern. Um, and there was like the other architect. It was not my project, but we were just, we were part of the peanut gallery. Mm -hmm. And this other architect was describing the building, the planning staff and the board were debating uh, the building and all of this architecty terminology was being used. And Faith, the engineer, looked at me and she said, you guys talk so strangely. <laughs> like no one can, no one knows what you're saying. There's yeah. like all of these, there were angry neighbors. It was a big condo project on the hill. So like all the neighbors were out and there were the neighbors who like had concerns about yeah. mathsing and context and, right. and like, all of everyone, there was like two separate meetings that were occurring. They would, the planning staff and the board and the architect were talking using these like words that were actually, as someone who kind of knows what those words mean on the in crowd, were trying to address their concerns. Right. But I don't think the general public that was there even understood that that was what was being discussed. Just going over right, the head. It, right. And I think that's something I hear a lot of people. Again, when we talk about ourselves and with ourselves, mm -hmm. it can be very sort of off-putting and pretentious sounding and inaccessible. And a lot of people haven't, um, especially they're not institutional clients, like they're terrified of architects because we talk in this strange way mm -hmm. and it doesn't make sense. They're like, what are they even saying? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to blow up my budget. <laughs> like, right? Like the Their thing. big and words are going to kill my yeah. budget. Right, right. Everyone, right. The builders roll their eyes and um, people are a little afraid uh, or intimidated by it. Uh, I don't think we're helping ourselves. Yeah. Um, and it can, no one wants to <laughs> feel dumb and be like, excuse me. What's that what's, word mean? What's that? <laughs> right, right. So I think like a big part of my work, my work and you know, you're educating clients about these regulations, but you're also trying to make them comfortable and realize that you're like a normal person, mm -hmm. just like them. You, FYI to everyone watch, 
architects are normal. Like, we're really pretty work. Like, we're not rich, like, Mercedes driving people. People are convinced architects are really rich. Um, like, we're normal. We yeah. care about budgets. Like, if I were doing this project, I would be scared just like they are because no one wants budget overruns. Um, so I think that architecture in general, and I think it's like a power, it's a power thing too with, I'm not saying it's just men, but in general, mm -hmm. if you're creating a language that's inaccessible mm -hmm. and makes people intimidated to ask you questions, like you're maintaining control yeah. in a certain extent. And I, pretty intimidating for that's a That's a good point, that you're kind of maintaining control and this position of authority, yeah, maybe, right. too. Like, well, I'm going to guide the design and I will take right. you through this, question me less, give Correct. me my yeah. way. Are there steps or intentional things that you do to try and disseminate that environment? Or I mean, uh, I just try to be really it? honest of like, I'm a normal person, just yeah. like you. This would be scary. I get you have a budget. It's a real budget. We'll do our best to work with it. Um, and I'm also not like a good drawer. Everyone's convinced like architects must be an amazing artist. And it's true, <laughs> back in the day when everyone hand drew and everyone was working 60 hours a week in hand drawing, like people were at much better drawers. I went to school in 2007 and <laughs> like we use computers and I can sketch things, but also, people are afraid to show me their, almost everyone has some sketch. I'm always yeah. like, show me your sketches. Let me show you one of my sketches. It's chicken it's scratch. Great. It's okay. Like, don't be embarrassed that your sketch doesn't look like an architect sketch. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, so, yeah, so just trying to, like, tell them that it's okay. You're bringing so much value to this project. Um Again, like the Thornton Academy project with this librarian who was like, oh, we have this space that we're not really, I don't think we're using it right. Um, and you're like, oh my God, you're right. Like we would never Huge. have even seen that space. It wasn't on our agenda at all. Um, and it was perfect for solving the problem they were presenting. Um, and you're right, it's a lot of times, it somehow, I don't know how to articulate it exactly, but in creating this sort of hierarchy of like, I am the all-knowing client and, or all architect and you're the client, um, this like trying to dissolve that and be like, we're a team, we're gonna solve this together is like really the most important because your client doesn't trust you enough to make themselves vulnerable and ask a dumb question, mm. you're all in trouble. When I was working at a larger firm, we'd be at school board meetings and you would realize that someone would ask a question they didn't realize, I don't wanna say is dumb, but they would be saying something and you would realize, um, oh my God, they don't. Like you'd have areas shaded, right? Like classroom area and this and that. And they would read the shading as like there was a wall there mm. as a partition, even if it was open in a hall. And you're like, oh wow. Like they can't conceptualize our 2D like concept floor plan right this is a maybe yeah. 40 million dollar building and mm -hmm. the question they're asking has nothing to do with that but i can tell from what i hear that they mm. can't read this floor plan mm. and they're making a decision that's a 40 million dollar decision right. that's a problem mm. so mm. it's we're i feel like in school we're taught how to work with contractors and engineers a little bit, not very well, but we are not really taught how to work with the people who actually pay us, the clients. Right, that, that relationship and also the interpersonal communications mm -hmm. of, you know, most of the people that I run into that are heads of firms are very strong personalities. Oh yeah, you because kind of have to be. Look at yeah. look at you. Look at I'm, me. I am not the head of a firm, that's for sure. I know, but <laughs> you've got personality just <laughs> spewing out uh, of you. It has to come out somehow. <laughs> but the you know, a, a head of a firm has so much going against them mm -hmm. to succeed and to achieve their yeah. artistic vision. So, in an architect, you have this very unique combination of artist, mm -hmm. business person. Yeah someone that has to manage relationships enough to get lots of money to be spent and manage as well 
and design and engineer to a degree, all of that. And it, I think it has either the, uh, the draw of someone that's highly complex and extremely driven, yeah. or if they're not that way and they really want to succeed, they're going to have to become that way. I think right. it has a process of hardening people to a degree and making them very This is, brash again, a head of firm, right? A head of firm. Very, I mean. Yeah. It's a different it, thing to be the head of the organization. To, right. Then, oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. And I would love, I, I'm a solo practitioner at present, and I would love to have, like, a wonderful staff of people to help me and you would have to become so hardened to oh, be able to deal with absolutely. those relationships i mean even like, now it's like maybe hardened is hard. the wrong word but no absolutely it's um i used to joke that one of our firm partners i used to call him the honey badger and um <laughs> It was, he was just so amazing, right? You'd be at these school board meetings and people are screaming at you or planning, like people are mm. upset and they're asked, you know, they're spitting questions at you and you are just there and responding and yep. people get very upset sometimes. Um, and yeah, you're just cool as a cucumber and like oh. you just, yeah, it's, um, I was always just so amazed at, you know, the ability to be cool under pressure, to like stay calm and focused and to write. You're in a lot of ways, regardless of whether or not this is a huge high stakes school building or even someone's mudroom addition, right? This is the largest sum of money, the largest um you know, infusion of capital, this person has largely like spent. Right. It's yeah. like a hugely stressful thing. And I've been lucky. I've had a, a lot of incredible clients. Like Chad Conley is one of them <laughs> that are just, they can pull it off and they are just very relaxed, very friendly. you never feel um, like any of it's personal because budgets are always super scary. And there's something about when you get pricing back that even if it comes back where you wanted it to, it's one of those moments where it's like the come to Jesus moment. All of a sudden you're like, yeah, okay. We are spending $3 million on this. We really wanted to come at 2 million. We thought it would have come in at three, but this is, it's in paper now in front of us. Mm. All right, mm. we have to cut the hello pad. Or, you know? right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, darn. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, I joked today, I was at a value engineering meeting this morning and we were reintroduced to the project manager and, um, again, one of the nicest clients in the world and was joking with, um, the project manager and we had some of our, even though we're not starting this project for several months, we had the team there and we were talking about different areas, you know, they were like, um, we were having some exposed conduit and we we're like, make sure it's neat, <laughs> tidy, you know, just think, trying to like resolve some of those um, things that might come up now, like months before we're breaking ground. And in this case, that's going to be like eight or nine months before these trades are going to be on site, but we're starting to coordinate. And um, I turned to the PM and I said, you and my client, our client, you guys are going to be really tight by the end of this project it's going to be a year you know it's like like oh, yeah. we yeah it's a it's a process and it's so relationships are so important and i don't think that can be underestimated this is scary stuff and it i always i tell clients you know construction is not for the faint of heart mm -hmm. you have to mm -hmm. be a little crazy to want to do a project I've got projects, you know, condo projects on the hill, meaning Munjoy Hill, and uh, they're, you know, it's contentious to build fancy or anything up on the hill right now. Neighbors are concerned that the hill as they knew it and maybe have known it for years or their entire lifetime is changing. Right. So to propose a new project, um, let alone a new big project, is going to despite your best intentions and your best efforts to um, make sure that it fits in with the neighborhood and is respectful to these buildings there are going to be a lot of people that are just upset by the idea in general right. and it can be hard to sit in these meetings and have like it is in your face 
you know. Oh, I've, I've heard <laughs> stories. A friend of mine who's gone through the same thing, he helped a client um, just from his experience, he was able to help a client uh, take a lot that they had that was on the back side of the road where, while the other side was on the ocean. Uh -huh. And he helped the client make that a buildable lot by yeah. codes totally. and acquiring a little bit of land. But the neighbor on the ocean side yeah. was just livid right. because he wasn't going to have a sunset view now. Oh. He, had, he had the beachside sunrise. Right. But because, and the waterfront, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. on the waterfront, but he also had this view. And, you know, it's a simple thing of like, well, if you want that, buy it. Change is hard. Yeah, change <laughs> you know, is hard. But, yeah, ch it's, any change. And, man, people get up in arms. And it's... it's yeah, it's... Um, and what's funny is people love regulations, right? And we're just like, yeah, EPA, all these things, until they affect them. <laughs> And then gotcha. people are just like, oh, wait, I have to have the grab bars or I have to have an ADA parking space. It's going right. to take up so much space because the van aisle is eight feet. Eight feet is also the width of a normal parking space. So I'm telling my client, by the way, we're, you know, a parking space in Portland's 30 to 40,000 right now, right? right? For some of these new projects. If I'm putting in a van aisle, like I'm taking away this revenue, but also right. this is like, really important stuff you know one of the things um about maine is we're an older state i don't know if we're still are we the oldest state in the country we're like older we have an older Maybe average we are age. the oldest yeah, yeah. Are we? <laughs> we're we're graying. Other day. i mean i'm graying too oh i just got my hair cut the other day i looked <laughs> down and i was like oh right what's going yeah. on right and so i think my parents in their 70s they're out in washington state but, you know, you think about our population, and honestly, selfishly, I think about myself. And uh, a lot of clients that I, residential clients, are talking about, like, how do I adapt? I love my house. Yeah, I've been I here. I'm right. A lot. How do I adapt my space that I love so I can be independent? Someone called me once a, like, fiercely mm. independent person. So I get it. Like, no one wants to think about going to a nursing home, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And planning for those sort of things before you break your hip might be nice. And I always tell my younger clients, you like to ski, you like to surf, right? Like, what if you hurt yourself and need a new ACL and are hobbling around? Might be nice to have a first floor bathroom or a room you could sleep in. Right. But a lot of people don't think about they're starting to more and more yeah. but like starting to plan for that now I feel like when great. obviously I go to a lot of job sites and right. um, I'm finding just in the last few months the job sites I'm going to are older couples that are uh -huh. trying to keep everything on the first floor and think about right. the future mm -hmm. um, overall do you think like we're preparing enough for like the aging right clients out here in Maine and the baby boomers um, yeah. that are aging and the fact that I think most people are have smaller families right, right? yeah um, our family structure in America is changing a little bit um, it's funny because right we have people potentially who are having less children per household I guess there are a lot of blended families. There are a lot of multi-generational families. So how do our zoning regulations, which, by the way, um, general public, tell you whether or not you can have an accessory dwelling, how hard it is to create one, those mm. sorts of things. Tenny bunk's pretty easy. It's like 30% of your main house. Yeah. You can just, no problem. Okay. Bitterford, it's like you either have a single family or duplex right. and your land requirement goes up to like four acres or something yeah. if you're in a normal no, zone. Yeah, so like sleeping's really like, like, right, so accessory dwellings which can allow families to have a parent or maybe an adult child, um, like living <laughs> someone, right, watch right. out. <laughs> <I know. laughs> they don't ever leave the nest. Um, it's like a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, you know, have some level of independence not and autonomy but also be nearby. Yeah. Um, there are some, right, some community, it's all over the map. There are zoning regulations, which are like, 
vary from town or city to city. But then there are also some regulations in terms of like fire protection. So if I do a change of use, again, these silly technical terms, Mm -hmm. if I go from a single family to a two unit, then in most areas in Maine, you would have to sprinkler your building, which is fine. It's only $10,000-ish people. It's not scary. It's not like 100,000. But, right, it's a hard, that's hard news to break to someone. Oh, by the way, we can add this unit so your mom can, like, have this independent apartment, and it's great, and we meet all of the zoning regs. But it, by the way, in the process of doing that, it's going to trigger this. And it makes sense from a life safety standpoint because you have more bodies sleeping in this square foot, feet, feet of space. I can't even talk. There's more people under this roof, greater risk if there's a fire for loss of life. You need more time. Fair enough. We can all understand that. But when you're the homeowner, you have to break it to you. It's like, it feels like kill the messenger sometimes. Yeah, $10,000. Right. You're like, oh, God, yeah. Here's another 10 grand (laughs) for you. (laughs) I I mean, when we built our house very recently, I mean, we were... From my background, I didn't practice architecture, but for three years, mm-hmm. and that was all in or in the mid aughts. Yeah. So it was all <laughs> garage master bedroom additions. Yeah. You know, so I don't really know what I'm talking about, but you know, everything that we did was like, all right, we're not blasting into the granite because that's going to be another right. twelve, uh-huh. and right. then we're going to have a concrete Thousand slab. Right. Yeah. Right. And so we won't have to. We'll have one and done kind of thing for your yeah. floor so it's like uh-huh. you know and we're going to have a very simple yeah. floor plan mm-hmm. outline so it's it's efficient heating wise and, yeah. and right. exterior totally. construction so there's an elegant for mm-hmm. us so there's there was a lot of value engineering uh-huh. like yeah. it was a yeah. pre-production meeting on value engineering right. that like didn't have to cut anything but said, here are the things initially that we're not even going to consider but Right. All of those things were a huge uphill battle between myself and my wife because she had ideas of what she totally. wanted. This she is, wanted yeah. a basement, and I was like, "How about we have a really nice attic?" You know, so it's interesting like, client relationship. You've got yeah, <laughs> she's still my client, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that. So it's interesting, right? Because when you meet a client um, and they're scared about, we have this sort of language that we use, but there's also this. Um, Maybe I don't know if it's true or not. This idea that we're going to blow your budget, like you're going to tell me I have a hundred thousand, it's yeah. going to be five, right? Yeah. But I feel it's the opposite. Like you were saying, you know, my job in a way is to rein things in. You tell me I only have a hundred thousand, and I'm like, no basement for you, you know. But we can have a good attic, and right. you from experience doing projects, or like if it's a restaurant, for example, trying to think about plumbing fixtures so we're not chopping up the entire slab right just right. just put a sink they have a sink way over here and the bathroom's over here and the other sinks over here and the dishwasher over there it's like okay let's find a way to consolidate these and to put these in places that still make sense from a practical functional standpoint but aren't going to result in ten thousand dollars worth of grinding up this slab right so in a way like I'm always thinking about value engineering. When we're starting, right. clients might not appreciate it. From you just know sometimes things are not on the table. Right, right. The ten thousand dollar refrigerator not on the table, <laughs> at least in my projects. Um, and right, trying to focus then on you know when you're listening to them, what is their priority and what are their values and how we can with the budget they have and the regulations at play make how make that venn diagram work so you kind of when you sit down with a client you're already you kind of have these bins that you're filling up as you're listening yeah. like all right here's the budget bin i know how much is in there but then here's the things they want as maybe services or areas of a building and you're saying all right you want this but here's the maybe appliances or whatever else that would typically go with that. You're already knowing what's in the budget bin and you're pulling things out of other bins that Mm -hmm. might be accessories to the things in those bins. Oh yeah. And so you're working out the design in your head from a financial standpoint to uh, their um, 
So you're, you're already in schematic design in your head. Right. According that's, to budget, desire. Absolutely. So that's yeah. what I'm, I guess I was saying earlier. It's already all coming together. When you get the budget and when you get the re regulatory aspect into it, you get the essential elements. Like at that point, before I've even put pen to paper to yeah. draw something, there are certain, you know, in a lot of cases, there's a lot, you know, we have to face this street. The zoning says we have to do this and have to do that. And it has to have a gable roof. And we can only use these sidings because that's what the zoning right. regs say. Yeah. It comes together, honestly, quite fast. Mm -hmm. So what what is the, this, and sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> asking a lot of questions, but what are what is the uh, kind of touchstone of, discrimination against bad ideas and ideas that you, or foundational philosophies that you use to then uh, inject this project with an aesthetic mm -hmm. that, that you bring to the table to, to go to that area of it. Like what, what is it that you use in your head to decide this is good and that's not good when it comes to aesthetics? Oof. Well, um, I guess to a certain extent, like my <laughs> wardrobe, I mean, I feel like clients are gonna fill your space with stuff. It is hard for me, I will say. There are architects, I think Mies van der Rohe, like designed clothes to go in his build. Like people would do go that far, you know? Like wow. I'm gonna design your building. Yeah. Great I'm gonna design, thing. yeah, I'm yeah, gonna design right. your clothes for you to wear in the building. I'm gonna build your furniture in. Like basically this is my masterpiece mm -hmm. and you will be my little puppet and <laughs> wear what I want and when I want. And it is hard to let go of that. But I think a part of it, a lot of it goes to, in terms of my aesthetic, like to a certain extent, is not about me. <laughs> and I think that That's is what, like in terms of like how, what it's like to work with a female architect versus some of these dudes. That's a really interesting question that I'd it's love to hear not, more about too. Yeah, I would say like, it's definitely, it's not about me. It's about their aesthetic and what, how they're gonna use the space and what kinds of stuff they have. Like some people really like to have a lot of stuff out. Like I'm personally stressed out if there's a lot of stuff out and mm. it's not like perfectly organized right. and all the same color. Are you a closed cupboard or open shelf person in the kitchen? I'm a closed cupboard because I don't mm. want to see it. Right, right. Yeah. Right. But if there were only a couple items out and they were well curated, but yeah, mm. <laughs> dishes in the sink. I cannot have dishes in the sink because it's just too right. stressful. So what do you do though? I mean, you have to have at some point um, clients mm -hmm. want something that you just know is wrong or bad oh, aesthetically yeah, to some hard. degree. How do you how do you communicate that? And what's telling you that it's not right? And yeah. do you maybe choose to just let it go? I mean, A lot of it, I feel like you gotta let it go. Really? And meditation, I play squash, <laughs> I lindy hop, I started making quilts this winter. Oh, like, right. you know, there's there's a lot that you've got to let go. And I think since I've become a practicing architect, I've realized it's hard to it's hard for me to judge someone else's building. As an an architect, um, you know, if I see a building and I'm like, oh that building, I just don't I like the siding color, this or that and I was like, well, they might not have actually been able to choose. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, they might not have meant to put that flamingo in the yard or that ceramic deer. Like <laughs> my dad had a ceramic deer in our yard growing up. Uh, Did it ever get shot? No, it never got shot. Mm. We were not in Maine, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, but my dad loved his ceramic deer. And if I met with a client that was like, I love my ceramic deer, you're gonna do it up, you know, you gotta just- Design around it. You just gotta, not even design around it, like own it. You gotta like showcase it. Like, and I think sometimes I'm like, would I want the ceramic deer in my yard? Maybe not, but like, this is their thing. Like, except who, it's their project, it's their money. And there are some things, so you have to have these moments where it's like, okay, this will go through planning board, or like, this is a big project. 
and they're our neighbors and they will have a say because it is, you know, a big enough project. We're going for, we have to have neighborhood meetings, we have to have planning board review. And you, in that case, we have a different conversation because it's like, I know you like ceramic deers. However, the city of Portland, city or whatever, there are design guidelines and it says our windows will look like this. And you're, we might be breaking both our hearts right now, but we've got to work with this or our project will never be approved. Right. So sometimes, yeah, you've got to let it go. And um, yeah, just, I think it's, perhaps more important this is a ridiculous conversation in a way and the fact that it's like it is their money like it's you and if it's going to make them happy let them have be happy and they're the ones that are going to be living there or working there or whatever and if they feel really strong i'll definitely like be like i don't agree with you because i'm an outspoken person i'm like i would choose this and they're like no if you know and again it's about this trust of like having a relationship where someone is comfortable enough saying, well, I think we should do it like this. What do you think? Or like, right. I'm not really feeling that window fenestration pattern. You know, it's like, I want my windows to look like this. And I'm like, wouldn't it be better if we line them up? Or, you know, there was some sort of pattern. So we can, you know, I'll often like show them of like, this is kind of, I, I designed it with your idea in mind. And I, here's another option and see what they go see for. yeah just like what do you think and in most cases they're like oh i hadn't even thought about that right. and or they're like no i really like my option and maybe we compromise somewhere in the middle because there are struct other structural uh, right. considerations or things like that but yeah i think a lot of it's just so getting your ego out and letting go you brought up an interesting point there just a bit like the, it's their money and they're paying you and it's yeah. interesting to me the dynamic of how and why people hire architects yeah because to a degree you're selling flowers no one needs them but like what you're talking about people do <laughs> they need us. no no but what but what we're mostly talking about most of your commercial projects yeah. people absolutely do have they're to use that right right legally to so have there's me. this yeah. i have to have an architect but do I just want to go get the cheapest one that will yeah. tick the boxes, right? I don't so know there's if I'm this the other. One, by the way, but I'm right. Be. No, I'm not I'm saying be. that. Who knows? But it's, it's possible. It's funny to me, or not funny. It's just interesting that within an architect, you hire mm -hmm. one because you have to. But yeah. there's also you have to. You're you're hiring one because of an aesthetic. Like people all day long have no, uh, you know, legal reason to hire me for what I do. Uh -huh. Anyone can do it. There's no regulation. No one's going to die if I take a bad picture, right? right. So an architect yeah. has this added thing that there's all these regulations and mm -hmm. everything else that you have to know, but you're also bringing the artist to the table. Right. And to a degree, the technicians can all charge the same amount and check the same boxes. But when you bring the artist to the table, that's when your price right. changes. Yes. And the dynamic becomes one that's different. It becomes the one that... Well, Tracy said she likes this fen mm -hmm. fenestration pattern a little bit better, you know, uh, right. you know, and that's where you get more into that building that relationship. And someone has come to you because they've seen other work that you've done and they start to have this trust with you mm -hmm. and you're guiding them through that while uh, embracing their design desires and everything yeah. else for their project. It, it can be, it is a very interesting relationship because in a way they always tell us in architecture, it sounds so fancy. Um, the job of an architect is to protect the health, life, safety, and welfare of mm. the public, right? There's nothing about that it talks about designing things. Right. And I always joke, and we design buildings too. So right. I always like start with that as my mm -hmm. commercial uh, clients is that the regulatory piece is such an important part, largely because for hundreds of years we didn't have these and bad things happened. Um, and I always remind people, all of these regulations, even though they seem cumbersome and like there are too many, we can go really back. They're good things. They are good things, and they're for a reason. In a lot of old buildings, for example, you'll see knobs for handles. I hate knobs. They're everywhere. You've got a knob. What? Yeah, exactly. Your what? doorknobs. Oh, so, uh, here? Right. Yeah, so oh, like so for small. people that have arthritis yeah. or like, I don't know, missing limbs, like it can be very painful or impossible for them to do a twisting motion. Mm -hmm. They're quite on doorknobs. So I'm like, 
commercial buildings, we have to use levers. And I was like, we, you have to laugh a lot in architecture because it is way too serious and stressful, right? So if your architect doesn't make you laugh, mm. you're in trouble because mm. it's, yeah. Oh, we'll probably we cry together, we laugh together, all the things, but you should laugh. So, I mean, I'm like, okay, let's think of all the different ways. If people are like, why can't I have my knobs? I'm like, Ugh. all right, let's do it. I'm like, let's think of all the different ways we can open a lever handle. I can open it with my elbow. I can open right. it with my head. Forearm. I can open it with my forearm. I can open it with my knee. I can open it with my foot. I can open it carrying a bag of groceries. Wouldn't that be helpful? I can open it carrying a baby. All of these sort of things. I'm like, can I do all of those things with a knob? The answer is no. Right. No twisting, no pinching. Oh, what's the other one? Ah, uh, all of the things. No grasping. I forget. Sorry for all the ADA people. Uh, I totally need to. So when we think about why can't I have this hardware? I love this thing. And I'm just like, ugh. Let's go through the procedure, and everyone is like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Because if you can bend your wrist, which is awesome, I can today, yay, right. um, it's not a big deal. But it can be a huge, like, literally, you can't open the door to the blank, the school, the business. I run into this in mid-January when I get done surfing, and uh -huh. your hands yeah. don't work, and you have a key that you're trying. Yeah. You have to actually pinch it between your palms yeah. to, to open your own car door Just if you wait. don't have as a, we're getting yeah. As we're getting so older, right. Another 40 years, it'll... Hmm. Yeah. As accessibility is one of those interesting things that... It's that was a, one of my questions. Yeah. It's <laughs> one of those clubs, to a certain extent, that any of us could join at any time where we start out potentially as completely able-bodied and able to, right, turn the knob and grasp and pinch and walk and run and step up. And then as we grow older, even if we don't have any accidents or catastrophic injuries, right, we still might find we have arthritis or difficulty, but it's typically not unless someone has had a personal experience with um, a barrier to access, it's just surprising how few people have even thought about it. Right. And again, we're in this graying state. Like even elderly people, I had a woman the other day, I was complaining, oh, my dentist office had a knob and I was so mad and I took a picture of the knob, which is typical of me, and I was like, this knob is not compliant. <laughs> um, and my friends are just like, oh God, there she goes again. <laughs> and one of my friends who's in her 30s was like, I have arthritis, yes. And I was like, see, this is not a frail 80 year old person with a cane. This is like, uh, if you look at this person, she's healthy, she dances, she does things, she seemed very active, and yet it really hurts to open a knob. So it's, yeah, that's, again. Making design accessible. Right, making Super. design accessible to everyone, right. And especially for commercial businesses, for restaurants and things like that, hilariously, like, sometimes people will say to me, well, people like that don't come to my business, or I've never seen, like, someone like that. And I was like, first of all, like, what does that mean, people <laughs> oh like that? I'm like, I don't, you know. Yeah. A lot of people are in wheelchairs. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're cool. Yeah. And also, like, it's like the reason why you don't see people like that at your restaurant is because there's Can't a step in. up or there's not a bathroom. I drink a lot of water, although I haven't during this podcast. I drink <laughs> a lot of water. I always have to use a bathroom. I can't imagine what it would be like if I had to try to find and, like, make a mental map in town of which business had accessible bathrooms right yeah uh, that's, like yeah. all you know it's like even if you can get in the door it's like okay i'm going out to a bar to drink with my buddies what if i have to pee oh there's not an accessible toilet here that's a problem yeah. Yeah. so that's in new england is you know you think about the west coast and perhaps this is conf more confusing to me because i come from the west coast and we have more new buildings which have been built since ADA regs have taken effect. Mm -hmm. In New England, we have all of these non-conforming, mm -hmm. like existing buildings. So people are used to um, seeing buildings that aren't compliant. In some ways, I am so used to and conditioned to seeing buildings that are non-compliant. I forget sometimes, I'm like, right, all of those buildings are wrong. <laughs> like mm -hmm. none of them are, you know, up to date. My mom the other day, I was um, telling her about this building and she's like, oh, 
oh, is that building up to code? Which is adorable. My mother's not an architect, by the way. But this is like, she's like concerned for me in this instance. And I'm like, mom, the building was built in 1849. It is not up to code. <laughs> not in the least. Not in the least. And honestly, how many of us in architecture have ever seen a building that is completely up to code? There's always some weird thing that doesn't get done right. But like barriers to access, the ability of to like turning a knob of like a ramp, you know. I knew a kid I met last year who they were trying to get like a ramp into this kid's dorm. And someone made the mistake of saying they thought the ramp wasn't gonna be aesthetically pleasing enough. They didn't want to add it to their precious building. And the mother had the most incredible response is ramps are beautiful to us. They allow us to access it's the first thing. It allows us to enter the building. Like without this ramp, I can't even go inside. That's a beautiful thing if someone is welcoming us and providing access. And I've seen some really and I've shot some pretty pretty nice uh accommodations of ramps yeah. that they turn it into a usable space as well right. and there's Planting. some really yeah. yeah exactly harvard just did incredible like on its quad had an accessibility um initiative where they made their historic quad like accessible and put ramps and they were of the same like stone that their foundations of the buildings and the stairs were mm -hmm. these were some fancy my clients don't typically have budgets like that but they were you know it's like yeah, it's like all of these things are like wonderful, accessible things we would want for our loved ones if they needed it. So it's this sort of, in general, society like lacks empathy, I would say, sometimes in a modern, <laughs> I don't know why, but sometimes, you know, if it's not about, yeah, it, you, we get in this mode of like, it's all about me. And you realize that in architecture, it's not really about me. It's not about my aesthetics. It's not about what I can do, I get to think about other people who, you know, maybe can't run and jump and kick and turn knobs. And that's like pretty awesome. How much of the degree to which you're actually empathizing with others do you think, I mean, I can only speak in uh, broad stereotypical terms between yeah. men and women because there's always outliers <laughs> on, on both sides, right? Right. But it, do you, I mean, to go into that subject a little bit, do you think that that's just a stereotypically more typical thing for a woman to be more empathetic and huh. to think of others and relationship more to a degree or? I mean, yeah, stereotypically, I mean, we are definitely, I'm so conditioned. I mean, I feel like I'm completely 100% conditioned um, to think about others in a way before myself, like that's, what women are taught all the time, right? And also a really good Your designer. Mom. I feel like, think, you know. It's like kind of yeah. nice. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, so, right, you have to definitely, um, I mean, as an architect, yeah, you, you have to be empathizing with your clients and you're, it's about relationships and in a way, you're empathizing with people your client might not even realize, like, need to be considered, right, in terms of some of these ADA um, or other issues, you know, that um, bike users, for example, it's so funny, like, Portland requires, and a lot of cities require bike racks, and they're like, well, I don't, I'm not going to use it, but no one's going to use this bike rack, and I'm like, well, we have to provide it, and that's great, and let's make it a great bike rack, let's put it in a Let's not hide it off in the corner, <laughs> like, you know, and yeah, trying to think about those things. Um, I'm a small, I'm like five two. I'm like not the most physically intimidating person. And, you know, as a woman, you probably know this, you think about your personal safety when you're in experiencing the built environment, probably in a different way maybe than you do. Oh, I have a story to, yeah, I, so I, very sheltered growing up, did not know anything about extended subcultures within the country and world, right? Despite so I knew living I, all over. To, <laughs> yeah, I'm very sheltered. So long story short, I knew nothing about uh, bear culture in, in the gay culture, right? Uh -huh. And I did a shoot in Provincetown. Yeah. And I show up and I finished the shoot that I was doing. And I was like, oh, I'll go walk around downtown. It, it, the place had been invaded okay. by 
biker gangs oh. to my mind that, right? And they were out at night and they were just like, oh, you know, and I was like, ah, and I went back to the campground, <laughs> locked the doors. I didn't know what was going on, right? <laughs> and like, I feared for my safety because there, I, you know, I see all these big dudes, and yeah. like, and, and then they were holding hands and it was like, they could have their way with me so easily if they wanted. And I like, this is what women must feel like. The next morning I go to a coffee shop and they're all like the sweetest, nicest guys you'll ever meet. I just had no clue what was going on. you were gonna on. get beat up by these what? guys? <laughs> I just didn't know what was going on. You know, I had never been around that and it, it came off as so machismo uh -huh. that, that I was just, you know, but it's just interesting. Like it was the first time I thought like, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. I'm obviously in no danger. These are like the sweetest guys ever. But this is, you know, what I experienced, that incorrect mm -hmm. interpretation of it. Yeah. That's how a woman has to think a lot of the time because there's, you know, other physical beings moving around that right. were they nefarious. I was gonna say. How do you deal with that? Right, you know? and a lot of them, I mean, Right. Yeah. I mean, so an interesting thing, Portland uh, Public Library right downtown has like a bike area that's like off the corner. And I went to a lecture there at night once and I went to go get my bike, which is prop parked in the proper space. And there's no nice. lighting outside. Yeah, that's so and like, so I was just like, you know, it I was wouldn't dark, think twice about that. Right. And I went, but, and yeah. I was like, oh my God, I feel so vulnerable. I'm like yep. damn, trying to get my, and one, I can't even see the combo on my lock because it's dark. So I'm like, a light would have just been nice from a practical standpoint, architects. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to judge the architect because it might've been value engineered out, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But so then I, you know, I can't help but think though, was that value engineered out? Or did not, someone not even think about the fact that it's dark in Maine a lot and mm -hmm. that, yeah, it could, one, I worry about someone stealing my bike and I, you know, and also it's like a personal mm -hmm. safety issue. I'm coming out at night, it's like eight o'clock. And so, you know, I'm there alone and yeah, I mean, you get yeah. catcalled, as you know, yeah. like by homeless people. Like oh, yeah. at, in societies, yeah. we're like moving through the built environment. Everyone feels like welcome to comment, to like touch us, and trying to make do my best as an architect to like reduce the ability for people to hurt each other in the built environment, like is kind of, you know, and create a sort of safe space. I'm always thinking about that when I'm designing, especially when you're doing site plans or master planning for like big projects. It's like, okay, like, am I creating some area where someone could hide and hurt someone else? And, you know, it's, I imagine that dudes don't think about those things. No, absolutely, 100% no. I can say that for, uh, you know, my experience up to, like I have a friend who's in his mid 40s and just experiencing like I cannot jump and move and run and everything, like his physical abilities are, you know, slightly waning. Uh -huh. And he's like, man, I walk through a parking lot differently when I experience yeah, totally. other people now, mm -hmm. where before it was like, I right, got this, never, I don't care. Right. Yeah. But all of a sudden there's uh -huh. just this little voice in the back of his head that's like, watch your back. Yeah, you might totally. not be able to spin around as quick or might not be as it's strong. like every day. <laughs> That's like every yeah, day. No. Like I always have, like you always have your keys yeah. and you're like ready. Like I remember yeah. once a couple weeks ago, it was kind of rainy. So I had, oh, it's going to an architects, right? Oh, I was just going down the street to architects. And it was kind of potentially rainy. So I had my thing and this guy came up to me and kind of like lunged at me. I don't think he was really going to. And I just like instinctively like Put up my umbrella. I actually had a similar situation on the way to Arkadox. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it was the same guy. <laughs> and I just went like that. And just like, it's just an instinct because yeah. I'm 37 now. So I've got some practice at like street harassment at this point. Right. And I was just like that. And I like looked at him and gave him like the devil eye. Like, <laughs> don't you mess with me or you'll be on the ground in five minutes. I'm not as small as I look. And he was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was like, dude, like, come on. Wow. I'm walking down yeah. Congress Street. You know, like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And so it's, you know, right. It's reality, it's, though. For more than half of the population. Yeah. But and, I, and I think it's, it's such a good thing to get more and more people 
into these positions of making design decisions yeah. and everything else that bring a you know a diverse experience to the table right. because like if you were on that team that designed the right. you know like well guys oh yeah it's dark at like mm -hmm. 3 30 right and, you know and you think people are going to want to walk back and they're like i don't care i'm going to get my bike right. well, exactly. you're not five two and have right. something that a lot of homeless men want maybe in that totally area. and you have to be like and if you are that if we're lucky enough and we're getting more and more seats at the table for those of you who might not know the slightly depressing statistics even today in 2019 about only female architects make up about 24 percent of our licensed profession and i mm. believe the last um stats i heard we were over 94 percent white as a profession in in maine or no no in, no this is nationally oh, wow. and i there was a good article in um was it february is like um uh, what's african-american history month whatever mm -hmm. um the official name of it is they are saying i think there's there are less than a hundred there's over 100,000 licensed architects in America. And there's less than 100, I think it's less than 20 licensed black female architects. Hmm. Pretty rare. This is a problem, right? And as our profession, it to I can understand why it happened, right? I get work because right now, as we were driving down, I was talking to a repeat this client. It's an interesting social dynamic. Right? It's, yeah, like I am lucky like I'm out there I was a former fundraiser so I'm good and comfortable working a room I also happen to like activities that um, typically have a affluent sort of high deadly. squash is you know we have an awesome urban squash program I will say and we <laughs> mentor kids and it's awesome we are trying to change the face of squash but squash is a great networking opportunity and there are a lot of business owners it's a great place to socialize if right. you're potentially meeting clients because clients are typically people who are getting recommended by friends of mine um actually that's how i met you <laughs> yes. so one of my friends whose husband plays squash had recommended <laughs> me here so it's all word of mouth yeah. but you have to like get somehow inject yourself or be born into these social circles where people yep. have enough disposable income which is typically not always true Typically, you know, minimum a hundred thousand dollars. They don't know what to do with, right? And maximum like three million dollars and up. Like the sky no is maximum. the limit. Yeah. There's no maximum. Like you can spend as much money on your building as you want. Yeah. But like entry to like having a conversation in a way about a realistic project, probably like a hundred thousand. Aren't a lot of people if you look at the our society that are in a demographic to yeah. like have projects like that it's it's changing but very slowly right. very very slowly oh, yeah. um but yeah it's uh, i look at what i do and mm -hmm. i realize that it's i'm i'm very uh, outside of my own skill set very lucky and privileged to be doing what i'm doing mm -hmm. and that it's uniquely because to a large degree you know born a white male in mm -hmm. uh, the u.s that I'm able to do what I do, you right. know? And what do you, what do you do with that? That's part of the national discussion right now, mm -hmm. as far as like, well, should you have, uh, I don't know what they call it, white guilt or anything else. And I don't sure. really, I, mean, yeah. I don't really carry that in any way, but I definitely acknowledge that like, oh yeah, I, I get it uh, that I have, um, you know, opportunity because of just mm -hmm. what I was born into. Um, I don't think that requires me to walk away from that opportunity, but it definitely requires me to be aware of it and to help in every way I can right, to absolutely. anyone else right. to come join me, right? Right. So, I mean, uh, off camera here is like uh, um, one of your projects that you've worked on where you are like trying to amplify the voices oh, one, of, yeah. Yeah, of voices who are not like you. And so one of them suing me, by the way, Oh, uh, you know, Sorry. it happens. America's legit, you yeah. know? Yeah. I just got a quote from my liability insurance today and I was like, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's, it goes up every year. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I feel like all of us in life as humans, 
crave, um, yeah, some power and control. It's like what we choose to do when we have that power and control with it, that really reflects on our character. Like how much can we work towards giving that same position yeah, to, to as others, many other totally. people as possible right. to, totally. to be able to enjoy having uh, the luxury to spend you know an adequate amount of time mm -hmm. at minimum with their family yeah um and to to eat food that is healthy to you know to take a vacation mm -hmm. all of those things all that, of those things yep you know that so many of us can so easily take uh just take for granted right yeah so like uh, uh, i do take on a fair number of like non-profit projects and um those are i guess i wouldn't say I'm lucky enough to have, I would say, corporate clients and other clients that enable me to charge those nonprofits I care about a lot less. Right. And I'm able, because I work for myself, to carve out time like to mentor kids in our squash program and help them, you know, it's it's not a level playing field in any way. And it as sick as it sounds, probably never will be because there's always some sort of advantage that someone will have, right? It's just, well, oh, you yeah. want to make I don't it think more it'll level, be completely right? level right. playing we can field reduce for barriers. everyone. But right. I think given centuries, oh, oh yeah, culture, you know, I mean, the... Uh, We're in a time of reckoning, which is awesome. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> but um, I love it. Um, but yeah, I think there's always going to be some people who have some sort of advantage and... So yeah, how can we use whatever advantages we have to help, again, amplify and support those who might not have had those opportunities? Right. I was lucky enough. I grew up in an incredible school district. I went to public school, but I had incredible teachers, and there was a lot of public school funding, and we had great music programs, we had all these things. And as a result of that, I was able to get a great college education and you know all of these opportunities and you know it's something you take for granted to some ex I mean absolutely take for granted um, when you have it until maybe you like leave your the confines of your community and you realize not everyone is so lucky because right I feel right. like you were saying before that you were like had such a isolated like very like, insular experience. Insular, but like, I feel like to a certain extent, all of us do, because we yeah. know, especially as kids, like we know what we know. And it's this kind of wonderful thing about growing up is you realize there are other things. And one of the uh, things I tell to my friends' kids and to all kids I meet is like, the best thing you can do is just embrace your quirky self. Like, because even if you don't, you're that kid or that person who's never met another weird person like you. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Doesn't mean it's not bad. And sometimes, right, maybe you're wearing a lobster shoot, shirt in like North Dakota and you cannot figure out why you're attracted to these like crustaceans. And then you realize, oh my God, I don't have to live in North Dakota my entire life. I can move, right? Um, and as kids, I think, you know, yeah, you've only seen what's in your little world and the nice thing about they have the internet these days so I guess it probably helps a little bit uh they can see their little friends on YouTube I mean it's, I can't imagine really growing up today um oh, yeah, right. that sort of idea of like they can at least maybe if you are wearing a lobster shirt in North Dakota you can realize oh my gosh I'm not alone there's this internet of people who are quirky and weird like me um, are you calling me quirky and weird? Well, <laughs> I mean, you are a recovering architect, so yes, clearly that's, sure. that's a re I think, a requirement. I need to go to a, a what is it, a support group or something. <laughs> or just embrace who you are. I mean, because I think there's so many, the hardest thing I think about just society in general, it does a disservice to all of us, to men, all the things, um, is that there's such a... We put try to put people in such boxes of like, oh, yeah. this is how to be. This is what success looks like. This is what men should be. This is what strong guys should be. This is the like sort of machismo mm -hmm. um, thing. This is what a strong person looks like, which isn't. There are a lot of ways I think to be strong and good leaders, and it's very. Um, 
it leaves out so many people who have such incredible things to contribute and people feel like they need to be a certain in order to achieve the success or what have you they need to mold themselves into something else well, or often hide the, who they the are. biggest success has come from the people that are breaking the mold yeah you know? right who are just being so, themselves i'd yeah. like to think right and so like learning how and i'm not saying it's easy to embrace your weird quirky self whatever that is i think is going to serve you right and make you the happiest uh, in the end my therapist she's awesome said you know <laughs> yeah like i have a therapist she's great all smith small business owners all people should have therapists but especially yes. small business owners right, right? <laughs> cuz it is tough and she said you know it's like well you know you live your life according to your values like it's not a surprise that you're happy like the projects you work on you really believe in like you're really an advocate for your clients but you you're not faking it like it's genuine like all these activities that you're you know this is you you're not faking it i think if i was doing strip malls or car dealerships mm. that might be that might be tough you know right so i'm yeah like you i consider myself incredibly lucky like i I'm 37 and I have a firm and I feed myself and I somehow fed myself for five years. And most architects my own age are just getting licensed. And I have almost all my clients are repeat clients or are like referring me to their friends. And I can't describe how awesome that feels to like kind of be on this sort of journey where we started with one project. It was all scary. Mm -hmm. We like... Uh, we learned to trust each other. <laughs> we got through the value engineering. We got through construction, which is a whole other standard of thing. And then they have more projects they want to do. They're buying a new lot. They have this new idea, and they want to include me again. Or they had such a great experience, they want their friends who have talking about their – or their friends are on the fence because they're like, I don't know. Like, this sounds scary. And they're like, it's okay. You can do it, and she can help it'll be okay like that in a way that's almost like that's enough like it's just yeah it's all about the relationships I feel like it's a small town I would say our state is a small town oh, yeah right yeah yeah our state is a small town the population of our state is you know smaller a than a lot of cities yeah right so you've got to really I think be invested in your clients in these relationships, you never know like where someone you meet, someone someone you meet like might be a client or or might end up, I don't know, somehow becoming related to you in some way. <laughs> I mean, right? That happens a lot here. Right? <laughs> I who yeah. Or like I have people who uh like I had a person the other day as a client and I just started working on her project. And she was like, oh, my brother owns this other building that you did a project in. And my client is like a tenant of her brother's. But it's just like there's like three degrees of separation at most from all people. So like and she's like, I didn't realize that. OK, yeah, my brother loved the project you did. OK, seal of approval, you know. But right, yeah, it's a small city. Do you, do you do any marketing, or is most of your business just word um, of mouth? It's all word of mouth, which was really hard when I was starting out because no yeah. one knows you, and no one knows you're open for business. Yeah. Or you, you don't have that sort of, and perhaps that's why it's so um, humbling in a way today is that I've only been on my own for five years. So, uh, yeah, I feel like everyone essentially at this point that's calling me is calling me because they're a repeat client. Their friends have recommended who have done a project with me. Um, or another one that's like really, I feel like just I'm so flattered every time I get a recommendation are general contractors. Mm. We're like, we really like that's, working with you. Yeah, that's like once you're in with them. You're, <laughs> but it's like, know. but it's like this idea, this like, and it's absolutely true, I get it. This idea that like architects and contractors just have this fighting relationship, right? right. And it's true. Like uh, I feel like being a female architect, there are some contractors who don't want to work with me. They're just like, really? oh, like lady architect, what? 
Um, and I've had this on job sites where someone will recommend a contractor and I'll meet with the homeowner and I'll go through the project and you can just tell they are just don't want to deal with me. And they're just like looking at the male client and my female yeah. clients there. And we're just like, we're here, like yeah. we're here. And this guy is just completely dismissive. Um, most of my clients are really horrified. They're like, oh my God, did you see what just happened? I'm like, yes. They're like, did that really? I'm like, yes. Also and happens very often. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, I'm like, yeah, I hate to break it to you, but by using me as an architect, there were some c- contractors and wow. just some people yeah. who won't want to work with us, Yeah, which is bizarre to me. I'm like, I'm 37. I plan to be working for a long time. I refer clients to contractors all the time too. It's not just right. the other way around. I'm like, I can give you business. Like, right. I don't know, but there's, it's weird, but it's mm-hmm. 2019 and sometimes it feels like 1920 out yeah. there. I did a project uh, <laughs> with um, Newforma. They're a mm-hmm. software company. You, you might know of them. I've heard of them. They do yeah. like building, uh, image modeling or yeah, like rendering or BIM. Stuff. It, crazy amounts of information around these massive projects like skyscrapers and stuff yeah. right so uh, but anyways we were doing a, a big kind of a video project for them and we did a, a bunch of interviews in london england and cool. it's even more so over there supposedly oh, like the kind of male dominated chauvinistic kind of yeah. Uh, atmosphere in the design and architecture world is is even more so over there supposedly yeah it's uh it's again i talked my mom was born in 1942 so you know she's up there in the senior (laughs) aarp crowd and owning it by the way um and yeah she's like you know we talk about i love I don't know, being a grown up and having parents, having a relationship with your parents, they're like, oh my God, mom, it was so hard for you. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe what a brat I was. Yeah. Like, wow, like, mm. oh, I don't know how you did it, <laughs> you know, right? So my, <sighs> my coming to understand that it, this is similar to my Provincetown, embarrassing Provincetown, <laughs> Provincetown story, but my coming to understand the difficulty and all the challenges and odd situations that women face yeah getting to anywhere you want to go in life whatever i mostly came to grips with understanding that through watching mad men oh okay yeah and i was like but that but right what's interesting though right you watch mad men or these uh shows and i talked to my mom about a lot about yeah that was in that era but mom it hasn't changed that much right yeah it's like every day Right, typically. I've, yeah, right. Especially, and I feel like you're, I mean, I'm on job sites a lot as an editor, but I right. feel like it happens on a lot of job sites. I can imagine if it's happening to me, like if you're yeah, uh-huh. not getting the attention. So you're saying when you go on job sites, like scouting potential projects to feature? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've noticed it, like when I ask questions and it's kind of like, dismissive right. yeah, dismissive, they, like right. she, you're not really going to understand what I'm saying. Right. Um, but I can, I mean, the question is like, where are all the female architects, right? So, right. I, and I get, I understand because they, they leave, they're like, I mean, yeah. you have to be pretty Right. Strong, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. to like things. deal with that. You have constantly. to be pretty and strong because like <laughs> that's a thing too. Like uh, that's a thing too in America for both men and women, right? If we like pretty people, mm-hmm. so I mean, it was funny. Friends, uh, they they had the analytics from their website uh-huh. and like the two most attractive people in the office, you know, just by general consensus, like the about page. You know, they're like those two just constantly people were clicking on them oh, to just yeah. see about them and it's just because they're good looking people you know right and totally it's <laughs> yeah it's kind of it's society uh yeah america i mean you work is, in a visual prof- we work in a visual profession it's but it's proportions um, and i kind of joke that like i don't have to look at myself all the you know <laughs> like who cares what i'm wearing but right we are in a really in some ways, again, a lot of my commercial clients are forced to hire me, but in general, architecture is a very vain... Well, they're forced to hire an architect. They choose you. They do, but 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I still, sometimes you can still, they don't want an architect though. They're not on right. board. Like some of them are like, they have to have me, but they still, they're not on board with having an architect. So I got to like win them over. Hmm. And usually by the end of it, they're just like, oh, wow. Because a lot of people don't know what architects do, right? right? Um, do, are a lot yeah. of your clients, or some of them, the, the first time they've worked with an architect? Oh, yeah. I would say for most of the I mean, a lot of them, again, are repeats now. Um, but yes, most people, I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, most people have never had to work with an architect, and maybe it's once in their life. A lot of them have heard horror stories about yep. working with architects, and I get it. For you, what, what do you think's been the key to you being able to continue to feed yourself and succeed? I mean, because well, you're, mm -hmm, totally. you know, you're very young for an architect. Architects yeah, right, don't hit their stride till like 60. Yeah, right. This is what's so funny. So like in this dot com era where you've got like Mark Zuckerberg and these people who are my age that are like some of the richest people in America, people who don't know architecture are like, of course you have your own firm and stuff. Like, why did it take you so long? Like, you don't understand. Yeah, no, it doesn't. I talked to the um, squash kids. We had a career day. And I was like, by the way, they're like, what does it take to become an architect? And I was like, well, you go to school and get Too an accredited much. degree. <laughs> you do your internships. You do your, at the time, seven licensing exams. And at that point in life, your average, I think it's day five. five? Okay. Yeah, right? Hmm. I had to take seven kids. <laughs> um, I took zero. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you and most people who went to architecture school, which is cool, but you're still highlight in our building. Yeah, I wouldn't so, be doing what I'm doing if I hadn't gone to architecture right, school. Right, totally, so. right? And um, that's one thing that's cool about architecture is there's all these like adjacent sort of like hidden professions. Yeah. Like adjacent, you know, there's a lot of product reps, a lot of a lot of interesting yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, and also just design, I mean, town planning, designing, oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. product design. It, it, it's it's such a broad and solid, good education. Right. That, yeah. Painful uh, education, but yeah. which I hate to interrupt. No, but, um, that's what that's like, what you that's, yeah. do it. Do I know, it. but I feel like we're getting short on time. Um, <laughs> we got we got all day. <laughs> People listen to these things. They Maybe put them I on should. when they're like driving to yeah. like New York. So. Drive safe. <laughs> Don't text while driving. I probably have to make an appearance at the office. Ah, uh, <laughs> but yeah. I'll vouch you for you. Are working, you are working No, this is this is <laughs> this is work. Even though I'm having a ton of fun, but um. I mean, that's the way it should be, like we were saying. Like, you have to enjoy yeah. what you're doing. And you should, like, see how, yeah. like, the sausage is made. So, yep. sorry we totally interrupted you. But so part of the reason why <laughs> Danielle is even here is because they contacted me at this thing. And I was like, oh, cool. Danielle's kind of – and she's like, oh, by the way, this white dude – and she didn't – she's like, Trent, but I'm like, a oh, white dude um, – is going to be, like, interviewing tickets. And I was like, well, that's nice, but there aren't very many women at the table in architecture – so if you interview me, I want you to interview me. <laughs> and they're like, and I've talked most of the time. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, but I, and Trent was on board. Yeah, well, and then it was like she, she rep, you replied back, and you're like, this has been in my draft box all day, <laughs> and I'm like, oh uh, yeah, because I'm that person of like, I want to include you. <laughs> so <laughs> I I I love it, and it's it's really nice to see what Trent's doing See? and uh, it's the first time I've actually seen you take a picture. Oh, yeah. oh. my index <laughs> finger still works. We've been working together worse. for a long time. Yeah. Um, anyway, but sorry. so my question is, and we were talking about how, you know, you, you're an architect, but like architecture leads you to many different things. So oh, Trent's yes. a photographer, right. can be a furniture designer, uh -huh. perhaps a product designer. Um, so outside of designing structures and yeah. buildings, well, buildings mostly. Yeah, right. What is there anything you really like to design or you have designed? Yeah, wow. Um, I so I have a repu I'm working on work life balance is so important. Everyone mm. listening, yeah. you should have work life balance. <laughs> but it's hard because architecture projects take hundreds of hours. I know our clients might not. It looks we make years. it look easy, they right? Take, they just, they just take years. Put them in years. No, they do. they do. They take years, but like at minimum, even the smallest of projects take hundreds of hours like it might not look like it based on my invoice but it does it does so there are only so many hours in the week and I often find myself I 
I joke that the weekend is a pressure relief valve, right? But the weekend always becomes the pressure. The pressure relief valve becomes part of your work life. And you yeah. realize, oh, I'm not. It's important to have other outlets in order to stay motivated, not burn out, mm-hmm. fresh, all the things, right? So I do, I mentioned I play squash, um, which keeps my mind agile, literally, because you're hitting it fast and everything's happening and is another community. Since I work at home with my cat and I, I should leave the house, right? And What's your cat do in the office? <laughs> she actually sits on my lap the entire time, like looking at the screen. It's amazing. <laughs> it's an incredible partnership. Um, I do call her my cat VP. My accountant told me I could not legally list her as my VP on like the state of Maine thing, which I was, I think that's like Distraught. wrong. Right, yes. I wasn't trying to give her m- like, I wasn't trying to evade taxes by it. I just wanted to give, give her credit. credit where she is my primary. Like clients are yelling at me on the phone. The cat is there. The cat does not like, <laughs> wait, it's, an, it's a thing. So anyway, in addition to playing squash and I like Lindy Hop, so I do dancing. Like I move about a lot. I ride my bike a lot. I also this winter uh, started quilting, which is kind of crazy. Like modern quilts, like all solids, crazy. Dying it's, art. <laughs> it's a dying art in a way, but thank God we have machines, so it's not like I'm hand quilting. Um, but there are people who are doing, it's almost like t- like laying out floor design or tiles. Mm. Um, and I had this project, this um, Drago Pediatric Dental with Dr. Mike Dowling. Uh-huh. Um, and Dr. Mike Dowling was someone who, amazing client, again, like didn't care about aesthetics. He was like, I need four treatment rooms and four hygiene rooms and a fish tank. <laughs> and I need to open in May. He's like, can you help? And that was like really it. And otherwise it was like, whatever you want. And like, that's kind of amazing. We have a budget, but like whatever you want. And I was like, I shall take advantage of this. So I used um, amazing like interface carpet tiles has like one line of carpets. I'm gonna forget which one. And they're like 20 different like colors. I used nine and I made it. This is again, architect term, roll your eyes. Abstract representation of a tide pool, right? <laughs> so I basically took the floor plan and I was like coloring all over it and just like this tide pool is going to like the seaweed and like it's undulating through the entire clinic. They, yeah, nine different colors, like interface, headset. They have an amazing service, yay, everyone should use. Most flooring people do where they will help lay out. I was like, this flooring pattern is so complicated. I know what I want to do, but I need help because someone needs to CAD this up for me and render it. And they're like, yep, we'll do that. We've never done anything so complicated. I'm like, it's okay. That's what you're here for. And I, you'll do a great job. And like most clients, and I was terrified. I was like, this could look horrible. Like this could be bad. Cause in my brain, I'm like, this is the abstract represent. And I kept, I kept, I was like, everyone, I was like, this is the abstract representation of the tide pool. Don't value engineer the abstract represent. And like at one point, the owner of the building, like was like, we want you to have beige carpets. And I was like, oh. no, this is a pediatric dental. The children deserve color. The children deserve <laughs> color. And like I, yeah, in that case, like it was funny because my client did not care, but was like, I trust my architect. I hired this architect. She says she wants an abstract representation oh. of a tide pool in my dental clinic. That's what she says, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And like, he got a song. He's like, everyone's like, the t- you know, it's like everyone wants this carpet. I'm like, well, you can't because it's a very custom thing. <laughs> it's literally, you know, these are one foot by four foot planks essentially. And like each one is a different color and it's like creating this pattern and it's, it's crazy. And I'm sure the flooring guy like was swearing <laughs> at me. Like mm, I felt really bad because this <laughs> pattern. So like in a floor pattern plan, it's essentially like each, each tile that's different has to have like a weird black and white sort of shading diagram. You know, one's like dashes, one's dots, this and that, and they have a color coded key. And usually you have one or two for a project. Yeah. I had nine and within a, a 10 foot square, there were like eight, you know, it was like, oh it was crazy. It was crazy, but everyone's like, oh my God, this works really great. And I was like, 
So that's one of the silly things where my client the, didn't really doctor, care, but the doctor. It, when he saw it, was he yeah, like, he's like, is great. This, right, right, exactly. He's like, I had no, and this would never have happened if I had told you what to do. I was just like, mm-hmm. four treatment rooms, four hygiene rooms, and a fish tank. Yeah. So like, and again, it was all about the, the, um, the sort of focal point in the sort of waiting room of this abstract representation of the tide pool, um, which is everything in life is basically an abstract representation because it's not real. That means not real people. Um, but We're the, experiencing the, a hallucination. Right, really. it's right, exactly. So the, the focal point of this pattern is right in front of the tank. So which is like, again, the tank was the thing, but everything is focusing at the tank. And yeah, no, he, everyone's like, oh yeah, this, the rug ties the room together, people. And yeah. it's true, and it's, you'll never see another rug like it. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Now all my friends are like, I want that. And I'm like, it's a custom new thing. I guess yeah. we could color with colored pencils and stuff. So after that, sorry, I was like totally, I'm such a politician. After that, Quilt. great experience. I was like, man, and I've had these in my home studio, which is like my guest bedroom. I have all these tiles because I have to coordinate everything with these nine colors, which is actually a pain. Like all the colors in the wall have to coordinate with these nine, not just one color, but nine. And so I've been staring at them for months and I'm like, man, I really like using like bright, colorful palettes, but I don't have that many clients who are just like, I don't care what you do, just do something. So I'm like, hmm, what could I do that's like that? I was like, I could cut pieces of fabric and sew them back together and make a quilt and it would hug me and keep me warm when I read books because I'm not supposed to work every weekend right life balance so I designed a quilt and I well first I like bought a sewing machine because I'd never sewed anything before and uh, designed a quilt um, with this sort of Hilariously, again, blue is my color, right? So um, Robert Kaufman Kona Fabrics has like 330 different colors, and you can get a book of those with a fabric slot. And um, I made a quilt that had, it was like a gradient quilt. So it was like different blues going from like light to dark. Mm. So it's like a little cascade, like very subtly. And it might, it was like a, a way to like, very similar to model making, right? In so many ways, because you're cutting all these seven by seven um, squares. You know, you've got the cutting mat. It's like brings you back to architecture school. You're like mm. this is where, like, I started out as an architect on the mat cutting, and then you're like constructing. You're like literally sewing it together. Lots of ironing, so much ironing, and then the end, you can like see this instead of like 400 hours or. 400 days within like 40 hours or 20 hours you've got this thing and I made one for a friend recently and now like it and it matches your rug I like coordinated it with the this was too architecty like I literally had the book on the carpet in the light to pick the you know the fabrics that would match the rug and you know and I was like, oh, this is too much like my day job when I was doing that, <laughs> right? I was like, this isn't different. Yeah. But it kind of allows you to play with shapes and patterns and textures in ways that I don't always get to do in projects, which is totally fair and legit. But it definitely like fulfilled that sort of creative need because it's so okay. Do you, uh, Danielle had asked if you, uh, like other things that you like working in design, you mentioned. Yeah. Well, oh, besides you're, the blue, yeah. Well, no, but I'm I'm from what you just went through. I'm I have a question around your creative process. Oh yeah. So photography wise, I have a f- another friend who's a commercial photographer who's he he'll like just take pictures all the time, uh-huh. and he kind of works through it creatively, and his process of approaching it is different. Yeah. I do not use a camera unless I've planned something out ahead of time Ooh, yeah like I I'm like that project was like you know I, I enjoy kind of conceptualizing designing planning executing you're like pre-planner yeah yeah like 
that's how I like to use my creativity. Um, but with, uh, with my friend, he's just like constantly taking all these images and then he'll go through them and he'll find these really great like little great moments. Curating and within that. To yeah. me, that feels like I'm just creating a bunch of work for myself that I'm <laughs> never gonna get to and I hate it and I don't do that. If I'm not, if I'm yeah. not working, I don't pick up a camera typically. I'll play with my phone and Good play with my you. kids and stuff. But I, it's just my creative process. I'm right. wondering, like, when you're not designing for work, is it something where you don't want to design other things? You want to take a breath is from that? that? Or is possible? it like a constant <laughs> thing that just comes out of you? That Is that possible? I mean, I'm always <laughs> thinking about, like, I'll design tools and stuff for things yeah. I want to do, or I'll be designing right. yeah, things to, to solve. Yeah, you have to. Everything. Everything. Yeah. So I joke that architects are professional puzzle solvers, right? We're yeah. like, yeah. we are always trying to solve a thing, whether it's a relationship or <laughs> it's like, right? Or like there's some buildings like, yeah, I'll be convinced there's sidewalks in the wrong place. You'll see like the path, you know, where it's like the trodden path. And I'm like, oh, they need to like do, you know. Architecture, I don't feel as much is a choice. It's just something, again, you've got to like accept that your brain is somehow like wired to always be trying to fix and come up with better solutions to something, mm -hmm. whatever it is, whether it's getting in the right place on the squash court, right, to efficiently hit the ball and like get back. Or like when I'm dancing, it's all in a certain way. It all comes back to ways of communicate. I've in my brain, I was like, okay, it's all about communicating. The built environment and spaces like communicate so many different things on behalf of our clients and on behalf of us when people are experiencing them. And like when you're dancing with someone, it's all this like nonverbal communication again. Like this lead and follow. I do partner dancing, so it's like jitterbug charleston swing and there's like no like i'm going to do a tuck turn or now or we're going to do a lindy circle you just are communicating with these like yeah. non-verbally right. and squash again like if i'm playing squash correctly coach mary lou i'm looking over my shoulder and watching my opponent for subtle cues in how where they're going to hit the ball and then adjusting my position on the court to what I'm seeing and how oh. they're holding their racket and things. That's kind of like surfing. You're, you're watching the yeah, wave right, to see exactly. what you're going to have to do so next. So again, these sort of, I feel like so much, again, architecture is coming, all coming back to relationships and communication. Like how are you like positioning yourself or reading the situation and responding to it um, in a way, hopefully, hopefully in a timely fashion, right? Hopefully before your opponent like, sends the ball to the corner or before you topple off of balance, you know, if your partner's spinning in you, you're not like centered and ready and responsive or like oh, I was in a sort of design charrette with a client um, and having this sort of inferiority complex of like, oh, what if I can't come up with the design in the moment? Because they wanted to, this was like a rapid right. sketching session and I don't usually work like that. Usually we have conversations and I'm taking meticulous notes. I do a lot of note and I'm like reviewing my notes and then I go back and I'm by myself with my pot of coffee and then I'm like digesting all of those notes and those conversations. Um, it's a very different thing to be someone's waiting there while you are like rapidly doing that. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. Like these people are gonna pay me and That's I'm just That's how an freeze. architectural photographer has to work, which is exhausting by the end of the day because you have all these other people and you have a space vac vacated right. that could be earning money but it's not because you're there that day and it takes all making day. magic it does and so it's like every you like what you do happens right then right and you have to it's it i found it ridiculously exhausting i've never really been able to put a finger on it exactly yeah. but there's a lot of pressure to right. if you don't get it in this a lot amount of time yeah you are not going to pay the mortgage <laughs> right you know? so i feel like to a certain extent like all these other sort of things i do are helping are sort of that sort training of your mind in yeah a way. you're training your mind right this trans it's a transferable skill in a way yeah. of like they're different forms of the same things i write a lot like you'll see me every morning i go to the coffee shop between 7 and 8 a.m and i like write and i like it's funny like what do you write on uh, I just have a little field notes guide that's made in America because I am all about, yeah, ethically sourced things. Um, and yeah, I'm just journaling and like, again, it's all about all these things in balance. I feel like um, 
yeah, variety is the spice of life. And in life where I'm frustrated or feeling burnt out or like kind of bored somehow, it's because I'm not forcing myself to take time for me and like doing these, like exercising my brain in other ways. Mm. If I'm just exercising my brain in Revit all day, which is the software oh, I use, yeah. right? I mean, I can be pro- Producing, but am I like really right. achieving our pushing potential? your brain into those places where it's not necessarily well trained? It, it's growing and it's learning and it's yeah. coming back with those things that it learns to apply it to yeah. all the things that you get paid for. Right. So, yeah, and that's again, I'm lucky that the activities I do happen to often um, allow me to interact with clients. So I'm at the squash courts and I might see mm-hmm. someone I'm working on a project with or mm-hmm. I'm at a dancing and you know I've had clients and at the coffee shop, it's hilarious. Everyone knows I go to the coffee shop and like I've had clients like walk in and give me invoices. It's always great when people like walk <laughs> in and hand you a check um, because they're like, oh, we just knew you'd be here. And it's good. I did buy them <laughs> breakfast too. Um, but yeah, so. There's this sort of, I, I try to live my life with a fair amount of intentionality because if you don't, life's still happening to you. So you might as well be a driving force within it instead of just a, part- you know, a passive participant. Um, mm. But yeah, I think it's, it's the cool part about getting old and my mother, my mother calls me old now. She doesn't like, I'm, if I say I'm a young person, she's like, no. But I'm like, you're in your like late seventies. Like, why? Like, don't you wish you were my age? And she's like, well, sure, but you're not young. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Architecture still considers me young, right? Right. But um, yeah, it's. I totally forget what I'm talking about here. Oh my god, my brain just died. That's all right. But you're getting. I old. feel like that it is. I, it's all related. <laughs> it's I all. I feel like it's. Yeah. It's all connected, and I. I think what you said in the squash court is really interesting because I played squash in high school, uh-huh. but. I was very bad at it. I'm like, horrible. and I wasn't anticipating. No, it's okay. I, yeah, I mean, um, it's a really fast sport, but like, I like how the movements, mm-hmm. like, it's all kind of tied in with like how you're planning your yeah. your designs. Exactly. It's so all cool. yeah. So it's thank you. My brain is suddenly restarted. Um, yes, it's all related. Um, everything as you're getting older, like feeds off of itself and you can see how this like sort of web of a life that you've like hopefully intentionally built for yourself is starting to sort of pay off and all of these things mm-hmm. like inform one another Ugh, another architect <laughs> it informed me the fenestration the value engineering <laughs> abstract representation these are like these silly words that um, we say i feel like i should like just have like a glossary and i know one of my issues oh, no God. i think I that know. would be helpful though it is. sometimes i will give like clients like a little primer and even silly things it's like true. direct or indirect lights like i'm like right. what kind of light like trying to explain what an indirect light fixture is. I have, I found at this point, like you get the little cartoony things that, and they're like, oh, and like the quality of light, when we talk about the quality of light, yeah. like what kind yeah. of light do we want here? And just trying to explain maybe like the advantages and disadvantages of different light fixtures. There are all these weird terms, yeah, that we just expect people to know, but no, like I wouldn't, a so surgeon would never to, expect yeah. me to know like technical <laughs> right but like right. in architecture again it's it, it come I, intentional or not conscious or not it's a superpower thing like if you're like i know all of this stuff and i'm not going to really explain it to you yeah. and i'm going to ask you to make decisions but i'm going to tell you one which one i actually really like right. and hope that you don't ask me any questions and just go with it um but yeah i kind of want to empower people i always joke that like when you hire me it's almost like an architecture 101 class maybe it becomes a 401 Mm -hmm. class by the time we're done but like hopefully like you feel really informed and like learn about Mm -hmm. a lot about architecture building zoning codes probably more than you ever wanted to know but you know hopefully people feel like they were yeah partner and in a well-informed partner they're not just blindly trusting me to make decisions although it was amazing when dr Dallin's mm-hmm. like do whatever you want um you know hopefully like again not everyone he had other things he wanted to think about like his mm-hmm. potential patients wow. so he's like you do your thing i'll do my thing it'll be great 
um, which is awesome. When someone, that's like a great example of someone who wants to work with you, right? Sometimes it can be harder when someone like doesn't want to work with you and you're trying to like, you know, a lot of ways like articulate your value to them. Like this is the code and this is why. When someone's like, great, whatever we have to do, just do it. And it's not like pushing back. I'm like, well, why do we have to have grab bars? Like, why do I have to have a a mop sink? I don't want a mop sink. I'm like, the plumbing code says we have to have one. Like, it's not like I'm forcing it on you. Bring it up with the UPC. (laughs) Something that I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, would be uh, advice you would have for women that are going through architecture school right now Uh that plan to join the workforce that plan to potentially become someone sitting in your position Uh of being an architect that's working on their own and succeeding yeah like what is some really good advice from someone who's been through that experience uh both avoiding the pitfalls yeah and you know navigating that that whole scenario wow there'll always be pitfalls all the time and that's okay and there'll always be these moments where, yeah, this. Is, I think, again, I'm not saying, like, women in architecture or I or whatever are the only people who feel it, but this sort of inferiority complex where, yeah, people will treat you differently. And even today, it's like... How do you emotionally deal with that? How do you compartmentalize that, put it where it belongs, and move on in confidence? Sometimes you don't. Like, again, I have a nice therapist where, you know, and I journal and, like, it's just something you got to work on. I guess I, in, you compartmentalize it, but you got to like address it and things that come up. Like one of the silly things that I have to, that's hard for me, I think part even more as a working class kid is like understanding and conceptualizing the dollar figures of like even what I'm charging for my own services. And I know I should be charging based on my rate and the hours that are re- hundreds of hours, people. And mm. I know that my clients are stressed out about their budgets and I'm like adding another one. And maybe I want them to get the fancy thing too. And maybe if I charged less, then we could get the fancy thing, right? Right. And I'd be like, no, this is value you need to build your client. It's ridiculous to say. I was like- But you're undervaluing yourself. Yeah, you're automatic, right. So like you have value. Like sometimes I used to always, it's funny because I mean, 37, I, I graduated from school in 2010. So it's been a couple years only a couple but I remember especially when I started out like five years ago I had a hard like I have a rate I have an hourly rate and there's this part of like it seemed like a lot of money like it's not a lawyer rate but like it seems like a lot of money sometimes like wow like who's gonna want to pay for like this is so much money and just like being like, oh, right, these guys must have something on me. They've been doing this for so much longer. And in some cases, yeah, architecture is awesome because the longer you've been practicing, the more experience you have, and that's beneficial. Yeah, I mean, that's money. Right, which is great in itself. And you have more clients. Yeah, exactly. So there's just some that I was right in some way to have, like, be intimidated by these guys' experience, but also I realize it's so funny. Like the regulatory piece now that people enforce regulations in America has become such a huge component of practice. A lot of those guys aren't comfortable like diving into the code. Oh, and the interesting. And stuff. So like enforcement of the regulations has gone Levered. up far right. more. Oh yeah. Where the people that were like, yeah. Right, and that now are have charging been, these high rates are now kind of like we need to bring in an, like someone who actually knows this right, because or we're like, right. actually so having to do it. I a huge advantage that I feel I've had is that I respect the regulations and my brain, in some sick way, God bless my brain, like <laughs> can think about these regulations in real time as clients are saying, "I want this and that." I'm like, "Regulation, regulation." Well, the empathy right? that you spoke of might be attaching that information mm-hmm. like well why do we not like the knob mm-hmm. the empathy in you says right. it's really difficult for a person with arthritis right. to do that yeah. and so you remember that you remember the ramps oh, yeah. you know you remember all, all the these things, things yeah. mm-hmm. based on an emotional attachment that Maybe. a person would I have I don't know towards. how it functions but somehow my brain re- like is good at picking hmm. out the regulations and in the past world which is I still I don't understand why these regulations weren't as big of a deal and there are more regulations whatever um yeah Yeah. compliance with those was pretty lax in a lot of ways um so that's been a big level like 
when, especially when it comes to commercial projects, there are just so many things like trying to wrap your head around the fa- like. So fair housing is required um, for any project over three units, right? So you think about even smaller like projects on the hill, like you've got to have an elevator or at least one fair housing compliant unit on the ground floor. It's a problem if your architect hasn't thought of that and you've been planning for a while. Mm, I've, yeah. heard, I've heard of mm. projects where um, that's happened and like late in the project, Ooh. you because you have first floor park rate in these narrow lots and you have to like suddenly jump through these hoops and you have a $115,000 elevator and lose a parking space and now oh. you have this eight foot wow. fan, you know. Yeah. So I started to realize that in, I'd always just, again, kind of given these guys like a green card, like just been assuming that these guys had been around for a long time. They knew how to do this stuff. And I would call and ask questions like of these older mentors I had. And I'd realize they'd be like, I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. They never used to enforce that. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, That's wow. Yeah. Like I'm even thinking to ask these questions up front and it's saving my clients headaches down the road and that has like incredible value Mm. and so a lot of projects um where i'm like recommended now have these sort of interesting sort of um difficult like code or zoning or regulation thing because somehow my brain it does a good job of like quantifying all of that um yeah it's a really fun puzzle because like someone was telling me the other day like we have all these considerations. We have like budget. We have like what everyone else thinks is their priority. These, we have to b- balance all these things. Something's got to give. And I'm like, the joy of my life is I have to fit. I have to make the, fin- the really complex that Venn diagram. You know, there's this isn't not just like elementary school. It's like two circle Venn diagram, right? This is like a plethora of all these different moving parts. And you've constantly got to like, keep your eye on the like few items that are um that are variables because really it does kind of come together on its own um which is great one of my clients once asked if they if i if they could come to the flooring rep like office with me and you know this is a room if you can imagine it with you know, you've seen like in interior design offices, you know, it's just books and books of mm-hmm. samples, right. like from floor to ceiling. There's thousands and thousands of different options. It's in, it's overwhelming for me. Like, and it's, I've got to come out of that with a couple options, right? With the help of a <laughs> rep who knows what our budget <laughs> is and this and that, like, I'm like, no, like, you need to let me do that because we would be in there for days and they're like, oh, this is great. This is great. And they, they're all great. All the carpets are great <laughs> for a different thing. But for this project, there's probably like we can narrow down like 85 percent of them without even having to open them. And then describing more of like our needs and, you know, all these different variables, we're going to get it down to a couple lines and a couple manufacturers pretty quickly. So it's just that, you know, it's just all this distilling. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it's exciting, <laughs> but it can, yeah, it's like super overwhelming sometimes. Anyway. I'm trying to see if I have any questions unanswered. <laughs> I don't know if I actually answered any of the questions. I just kind of <laughs> no, you did, did my thing. <laughs> um, I guess one last question. Well, Trent probably has one after. I'm right? just peanut gallery here. Uh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> clearly. Just keep monkey um, wrench, <laughs> peanut gallery. If so far, so you've been practicing since 2010. Yeah. What's the most gratifying project you've worked Ooh. on so far? Oh man, gratifying project. And why? Oh, and why? <laughs> Don't just you name it and walk away. Great, <laughs> awesome, peanut gallery. Well, I used to do a lot of school designs, and school designs are awesome and warm and fuzzy feeling for me. I mean, I... Why New, so? New England has a lot of private schools, but I am, like, entirely public school educated. So public schools serve, like, all kids, regardless of abilities, you know, regardless of income or where they're living. And, you know, really are... Again, we talked about this, like, isolation factor. As a kid, you only know your, your own thing. Right. 
but schools teach you schools kind of widen that sort of um, widen that sort of horizon and teach you about reading and you realize books might tell you things about sea turtles or dinosaurs or buildings like I remember as a kid there was this sort of silly like how to draw stuff books I don't know if you remember that right Yeah, yeah right and just like I remember just like being so excited when it was my class's library day and I could go and I could see what other one I hadn't gotten and I could learn to draw things. Right. And yeah, it's that sort of learning process is so empowering. I still feel learning is incredibly empowering today. I say, I would say knowledge is power. So learning how to learn is something that's just really important to me. Again, while educating my clients or like kids in Maine, um, I mean, in Maine, we've got a lot of our school kids are, you know, free and reduced lunch, right? So, I was like, I'd never met an architect before I went to architecture school, which is really funny. I knew it's what I wanted to do, but I'd never really met one of these silly people. Um, I don't know if I would have been if I had, because... I went and observed an architecture firm okay. to see if I wanted to, and they were pretty negative about it. Yeah, right. And I was like, hmm... That doesn't seem like fun, but I'm still going to go to architecture right? school. Right, uh-huh. <laughs> well, there you go. So, yeah, um, but, yeah, it seems like it just opens doors. It, like, helps with that sort of process of, like, hopefully, ideally, you know, not all schools are probably like this. I was really lucky. I had incredible teachers, incredible programs, but just, yeah, helping you figure out who you were and be comfortable with that, hopefully, and accepting of that. So I, I've always, like, this has been kind of like always my uniform, like for lack of a better term of like Mm -hmm. the jeans and the sneakers and like the collared shirt. When I was, this is back in the day, but not too long ago, when I was in like fifth grade, I think I added a a tie to that, right? (laughs) So I was wearing like a Looney Tunes tie, which was super cool and was like not, and I had pretty short hair too. And, I mean, I grew up in a pretty progressive area of Washington State, but all of a sudden this, like, little girl is a short hair is, like, wearing a tie every day. And, like, a lot of kids would be bullied. I'm sure I was. But I remember, I was in, a, like, a little school district, and I remember a superintendent would come up to me in class, and he'd be like, I like your tie. You did a really good job of tying it in front of all the other kids. And that's kind of like, and I was like, Oh, I thank you. And, you know, but it was a good way of, like, telling me, like, kid, I know you're different. And, boy, it's probably really hard. But, like, we're here for you. Like, it's okay. And I think schools, like, yeah, I, that's kind of ideally um, my progressive agenda. Ideally is we're teaching people that it's okay to be you. And here's some great opportunities you might not even thought about. And... Go for it, kid. Um, so yeah, to be part in the and in schools too. It's in Maine especially. Like you think of these little towns. Like there's not much else going on. And if you're talking about injecting forty, sixty, a hundred million dollars into that community, that is the largest influx of capital and investment in that community, which might have seen like paper mills going, things leaving, and you've got this new building. And again, these people might not have seen a new building in their town in a lifetime, decades. Our school buildings are really old. So to be a part of that is such a cool process. It's creative. It's political. I have a lot of experience with political stuff. So it's mm-hmm. highly political. You're in these meetings where neighbor, everyone's mm-hmm. passionate about their things. Yeah. The pottery studio is the most important thing here. And someone else says the dance studio is. I want to cut dance and pottery. You know, like... And you're navigating, like a politician, like this, all of those things to try to create a community and make everyone feel engaged and heard and valued. For lack of a better term, I feel like in life, we all want to feel included and heard and valued, right? So like, and we, in the design process, that's like our job as architects, if we've done a good job at the end of the day, in events like that, everyone feels like, we understand they've been heard they're valued and they're yeah that's that's our job and that's pretty awesome feeling and then we get to walk into it someday and like that just like blows your mind so the 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 the, what was the term you used for most uh gratifying the most 
gratity. What, what's the gratify? <laughs> what's the most? What's the most gratitude you? The, yeah, but um, it seems like what really gets you with those projects is that you're being involved in that, in the design of that space that incubates the possibility of what these kids can become yeah, and, and it, it really fosters that totally and it's like um cultivating like this community and helping it and like realize the shared values that they might not have even realized they had um you know when they first came in the meeting yeah. so being involved in in creating and and being involved in that those yeah. possibilities and right yeah, yeah that's really interesting hmm. and yeah it's not even just like some politicians, you know, when you're gun control legislation, like that's an amazing thing. I'm all for gun control legislation. It's not to be too political. But like at the end of the day, though, you ban your AR-15s and all the things, background check, blah, blah, blah. That's amazing. It's abstract, right? We take something that building plans are an abstract representation of real life, and it turns into real life. Right. So we take those things that are like, really hard to grasp and we make them real that you can touch and sit in and that hopefully if we've done our job right do the things our client wanted like cultivate community create great safe fun inspiring learning spaces and again hopefully it all works out and they're happy with the space and maybe it performs even better than they thought but that's a pretty cool thing not all professions are like that a lot of politicians, including like Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Deval Patrick, their dream job, hilariously, is to be an architect. And I totally get it. Because at the end of the day, it's hard to like quantify the tax reform package, right? But right. I can walk into Thornton Academy's library and see kids that are studying in those captured spaces and it's interesting to me to hear your take on the value and what gets you going on those compared to uh, a lot of other things I've heard. Like you're, you're not looking to like, uh, here's, you know, I, that's me, I did that. <laughs> it's, it's more so like you're captivated by the process, uh, empowering people mm -hmm. and uh, infusing and empowering that the possibility of those of people their vision less yeah in that, yeah like and mine, it's I and, like. and i i see a lot of personal identity coming through in other conversations right. i've had not even on this podcast but yeah, just with totally. other people there's a lot of i achieved i made that yeah, happen and right. i made something that looks Ugh, good right. and it's left yeah. in the community and it's just interesting mm -hmm. that that, and that's. You I don't know, know if that's a gender. See, I I, I don't know if that's I think gender, it is. whatever. Yeah, I think a, it is a, a stereotypical bit. Yeah, bell totally. curve gender thing, maybe. Um, and I think there's to a degree, a place for it, uh, totally. and it's one way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting to hear how passionate you are about empowering and being part of the the beauty of that community yeah. coming together and creating totally. that. so it's interesting if you read on my website like when i do have project profiles like i so in a lot of firms and this is why i hate like sorry aia main they recently <laughs> had their design awards and it it drives me crazy the idea that one person or a firm can accept an award mm. for a building because like to me i could never accept award for like again i worked on this when I was at another firm, right? But I was one of many people there. And there were so many, like the client had to be down with everything. Mm. Like their board had to be okay with it. And we had contractors, stuff. there were so many people who made that idea that wasn't even mine. It was the librarian's idea, right? It wasn't even ours. Like. I, it's hard to take ownership mm. of my projects, I feel like, because there are so many people involved. Um, but like Rose Foods is a great example because there's a mirror when you walk in Rose Foods and it's hand painted. Mm. And But the mirror was Chad's wife, Rachel. She had, it's like, why don't you put a mirror there? It's like, that would be great. And everyone loves a mirror. Like mm. that wasn't, you know, that <laughs> helps make this, right, exactly. And like Joe Kivitz, um, who's a great artist and helped us on some like, 
I couldn't be bothered to like handle like the tile and the colors and things. And Joe and Chad was a good buddy of Joe's and was like, I want to, I trust Joe to deal with those things. Basically when I was hired, Joe was already on the team. Like you have to work, be willing to work with my friend Joe. Cause like I dig his aesthetic. Like he's gonna, he understands my vision architect. I don't know about you, but like, I trust this guy to get it right. Will you be willing? I'm like, of course, because like, I, it's a complicated, yeah. it's a complicated thing, and it's a team, and it, it doesn't seem like you have a high propensity for wanting to control everything. Uh, I'm a control freak, but you gotta let go. You just gotta learn to let go because, right. oof, yeah, hmm. it's yeah. There's a lot of people, and again, so my ex-husband, who's a really wonderful man was a carpenter, a finished carpenter. And like, before I became an architect, like we'd already gotten divorced by the time I like got a license and finished school. But I would hear him talking about architects and about, and I, I know a lot of contractors. Um, and you know, they're always talking about these silly details architects come up with that aren't buildable yeah. <laughs> or like, why did they do this? This is so dumb. So I'm always like trying to have a dialogue. And again, a relationship, perhaps this is why contractors recommend me all the time is that I'm always trying to, build something that they're not going to, that they can be proud of and that makes sense to them. They can build, they're the ones that are going to be at the end of the day, one pricing my project, FYI, right. architects, if you design something that everyone's like, what the hell? Your clients are going to be paying for that. Um, labor is like between 30 and 50% of a job. So if they think you're making something unnecessarily difficult, your client's paying for that. So trying to like be mindful of the craftspeople who take a lot of pride in putting something together. Like I remember this one project, we were adding heating and air conditioning to a previously unused space. And I come up with a design and I told the GC, I was like, I want to meet with the HVAC guy in the space. And he's like, I'm like, can you facilitate that? This was before permitting. This was like, it was like, I know, you know who you're going to use. I want to make sure they're comfortable with working with the design I've come up with. Cause like I can just tell someone what to do, but I want to make sure that they agree. It makes sense. And I made this 3d diagram and all the things cause there were like all these structural beams and it had low head heights and I'd made them this chase to work in with like doors in certain areas to make sure they had access and they got a space and they're just like, I've never, had an architect ever ask me what I thought or ever invite me to a job site before permitting to make sure that I was okay with the design and ask me right. if I had any changes. And I was like, what? <laughs> I have this fancy design. This is so funny. I was saying, so I have a master's in architecture, but before I did that, I got a master in interdisciplinary design for the built environment from Cambridge in the UK. Fancy school, yada, yada, yada. Very, it was great. It's not a pretentious place at all. I mean, it's a whole bunch of nerds that are really, really passionate about things. And they could talk your ear off about whatever silly snail they're passionate about till like three in the morning. You know, it's, it's a fun place of people who are just really excited about what they're working on. And I really dug that. Um, but it's funny because like most of my classmates are working on skyscrapers and football stadiums or museums or hospitals or these like hundreds of millions of dollars, half a billion dollar projects, right? And I find that in these like little projects like Rose Foods, like these skills that I've yeah. learned of like working with others are valuable, <laughs> right? So I sometimes joke and one of my client, one of my classmates who just opened this huge again, like half a billion dollar hospital like in England, I had coffee with him a year and a half ago when I was like visiting London and yeah he's like yeah I'm like a senior partner at this huge international firm and like I'm doing all these ask him like, how his life balance is well I mean you're very yeah exactly but also he's like I don't get to do yeah he's the probably arts. more of a manager right yeah right at that point so he's like I'm so jealous of you <laughs> and I'm like this is good cool. to know <laughs> this is good to know perspective my friend Oh yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Cause it's, and I think that's a huge thing of adulting too. Like even without the Instagramming weird life and the airbrushed photos, like 
we yeah we're all like insecure humans and we've yeah we could all use therapists so I agree with that just acknowledge it so yeah I definitely don't have life figured out but that's okay well, you did state that your therapist was uh, explaining to you why you're happy. Well, yeah, so sure. That but seems you like know, a pretty good problem to yeah, have. Yeah, but or? still, I mean, again, like clients, you know, one, I started seeing a therapist like five years ago when I was about to start my firm. I just got laid off because that happens in architecture. Yeah. And I was like, what do I do with myself? That was my dream job. I lost my dream job. I was designing schools. Like, I thought that was going to be it the rest of my life. And all of a sudden, I wasn't. And I was like, there's no other firm I want to work for in Maine. No offense to the, all these great firms, but I was like, that was the firm for me. I was in my special place, and it wasn't my special place. What do I do now? I'm like, I need someone to help me figure this out. And I'm too scared to start my own firm. At that point, I was like, was almost licensed, but like wasn't quite there yet. So I'm like, I'm not even licensed. Who's going to hire me? I'm like this young kid. Like... Right, you're supposed to wait till I'm 65, right? right? And so, you know, help me, like, she was amazing and, like, help me sort this out. And I'm like, wow, I need to keep you around. Like, now that I've started this firm, because I'm going to have problems where, like, these inevitable things, I'm going to have to fire a client. I've done that before. Like, you know, a client's not going to pay me. That's happened before. You know, all these, like, really stressful things. Like, I might have to fire an employee or lay someone off or, like, all these things are, like, Every, this happens every like someone dies at your job site you know like these things mm-hmm. are just realities that as horrible and as they are just are things that just happen in life life happens adulting is hard and it is nice to have someone <laughs> there where I was like yeah I remember once oh, the first time I fired a client like I was like therapist I have this million dollar project and I just accepted it, and I think I need to fire them already. And she's like, okay, I can see you at 1 o'clock. And I'm like, thank you. And then I'm in the meeting, and I'm getting these, like, horrible text messages. I mean, we've just started this project. I'm already getting these, like, nasty, nasty text messages from from this client. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, let me read you these. I'm like, this is not going to work this is good but it's hard to like walk away from like a huge you know that was my first like million dollar would have been my first million dollar project at that point but I'm like this is going to ruin my life but I need someone to like walk me through even though I know it's like mm, Mm. that's really figured out it's okay again thank you both for coming down um and uh check out Tracy Reed's article in the August issue coming up August sponsoring another podcast and look forward to seeing the article.